Pancreatitis, at its core, is a very simple disease. The illness script is easy to remember. But we know a lot about pancreatitis and its complications, and so there are a few nuances that I wanted to coach you on. First, I want to go through the classic presentation and management of standard pancreatitis. Then I want to go over some of those nuances, those things that we've tried empirically and have found that don't work, the things that people like to do that they shouldn't, and when to do what tests ancillary to the standard process of pancreatitis. Then finish the lecture with some complications. Before we move to the board, I just want to say that pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas, but it's more than that. It is autodigestion of the pancreas. The exocrine function of the pancreas is to secrete digestive enzymes into the duodenum to help you digest food. If those enzymes that break down protein don't make it to the duodenum and activate in the pancreas, they still break down proteins. And that's what happens in pancreatitis. There's autodigestion of the pancreas from its own exocrine function. So how does that happen? Well, pancreatitis in the United States is generally caused by two things, alcohol and gallstones. Yes, the list of things that can cause pancreatitis is quite long, but what you, where you should go right off the bat is alcohol or gallstones. The patient presentation is going to be an epigastric abdominal pain that radiates to the back. This pain is going to be positional, that is, it's better with leaning forward and worse with leaning back, stretching out the precordium, and is associated with nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. And in fact, anorexia is a great sign that the patient is getting better. If the patient wants food, that means the pancreas has cooled down and they're ready to eat. Ongoing anorexia is a sign that there's ongoing pancreatic inflammation. The diagnosis is made with a lipase. Lipase is the best test. And the lipase will be greater than three times the upper limit of normal, whatever the lab may be. Traditionally, people have used the amylase. And in the right clinical context, if either the lipase or the amylase were elevated, it was called pancreatitis. The amylase is not a good test. The amylase can be elevated when the gallbladder is inflamed or when they're simply vomiting. So amylase isn't good, you should use the lipase. Some centers have got a pancreatic specific amylase, the amylase P, which approaches, approaches the sensitivity of the lipase. So you have a person who came in, epigastric pain that radiated to the back, positional, got a lipase that was elevated, they've got pancreatitis. The only way to treat this is with time. And what you want to do is cool off the pancreas. Let the pancreas not secrete any more enzymes. You do that by making them NPO. And because they're NPO, they'll need to be supported with intravenous fluids. And because pancreatitis hurts, they're going to need some pain meds. And then you just wait. And you refeed them on demand. That is, when they want to eat, you feed them. Until then, you give them pain meds. So that's not very complicated. But of course, there's more to it than this. Again, the list of pancreatitis etiologies is really long. After alcohol and gallstones, where you should go next, are going to be medications, especially antiretrovirals, hypertriglyceridemia, and trauma. And trauma means ERCP. In fact, about 30% of ERCPs will have some form of pancreatitis. When the patient presents, and you'll see these more on the exam than you will on a real person, the pancreas is retroperitoneal. And if it's bad, you might see some signs of retroperitoneal hematomas. And that's going to be the Cullen sign and the Turner sign. You turn onto your side, and your side is your flank. Turner sign, flank hematomas, umbilicus, umbilicullens, cullen sign is umbilical hematomas. Generally not seen in real life, but seen on the test all the time as a sign for pancreatitis. And here in the diagnostic steps is where they can really trip you up. What should you do and when? The CT scan was once thought to be harmful to pancreatitis. 
It isn't. The idea was IV contrast and radiation during inflammation was bad. Turns out it doesn't do anything bad. But it may not be good either. You do not need a CT scan if the lipase is elevated. You get a CT scan when you know the person has pancreatitis, but the enzymes disagree with you. The clinical scenario is clear, but the enzymes aren't elevated. That's when you get the CT scan. And in clinical practice, it may be harmful to get a CT scan right off the bat because it'll be normal or it'll show you the pancreatitis. And because you already got a CT scan, you'll be less likely to get the CT scan repeated when you need it. We'll talk about that in the complication section. In terms of diagnosing pancreatitis, the ultrasound is a terrible test. You can't see the pancreas very well. But after you've diagnosed pancreatitis, one of the things you're considering is gallstone disease. So the ultrasound can show you etiology. That is, if the pancreatitis is from gallstones, you get the ultrasound to see the gallstones. The same thing is true of the MRCP. It's just like an ERCP, except it doesn't involve any contrast risk. So the MRCP is a terrible test to diagnose pancreatitis but it can show you strictures and malignancy that you didn't know were there. And so in terms of working at the etiology of pancreatitis, the MRCP is not bad. So if you're asking for the diagnostic steps for pancreatitis, don't do ultrasound or MRCP. Do them when you're looking for the etiology. And CT scans are reserved for complications or when the diagnosis is in question. We also try to do a lot of things in the management or the treatment of pancreatitis. One of the things was early refeeding. The idea that maybe this was going to be protective of infections. It doesn't matter. Use on demand. When they're hungry and their anorexia resolves, feed them. We also thought about empiric antibiotics, especially when the person got sick. Turns out that those don't work. There's a very specific time, and we'll talk about it, when you do use antibiotics. But what we do know is if you're going to use antibiotics, meropenem, is better than ciprofloxacin. And much like the ultrasound, the ERCP can be used. When the ultrasound shows gallstones and you have gallstone pancreatitis, the ERCP is the treatment. You should not be ordering ERCPs on pancreatitis unless you know that it is gallstone pancreatitis and the stone that's obstructing the pancreas is still present. That is, on the ultrasound, you see dilated ducts and the building ribbon remains elevated. The stone that passes on its own with pancreatitis that's getting better and LFTs that are coming down, you don't want to do an ERCP on because the ERCP risk of pancreatitis can exacerbate the pancreatitis. So ERCP is done in cholangitis, emergently, and then in gallstone pancreatitis when the stone fails to pass on its own. Okay, so we just took a simple disease and made it much more complicated. And you can see all the things that they might trip you up on by giving you that option at the wrong point in time. So one more time, alcohol and gallstones, epigastric pain that radiates to the back, anorexia, lipase elevated, NPO, fluids, pain meds, and wait it out. All this ancillary stuff is there when you need to go to the next step. But after the pancreatitis is over, you may still have problems, and the complications of pancreatitis you do need to know about. I've broken them down into three categories. Early complications, mid-complications, and late, based on the time of onset. Early complications usually happen in the first couple of days. Mid-level complications happen in the first couple of weeks. And late complications take weeks to months to develop. And what you need to do is be able to recognize the clinical scenario, in which the complication arises, how to diagnose it, and then how to manage it. Probably the most fatal of these diseases is ARDS. Much like in sepsis, pancreatitis has a lot of inflammatory mediators. It's a very pro-inflammatory disorder. And so what'll happen is you'll get leaky capillaries, just like they're full on sepsis, only there's no bacteria, there's no infection. ARDS causes a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema diagnosed by chest x-ray and treated with intubation. Essentially, you need to just get them through it. This has a very poor prognosis and most patients die and those who don't end up with scarred lungs. 
What could happen is called saponification. That is, calcium interacts with the pancreas and literally turns to soap. In doing that, the pancreas dies and calcium is consumed. You detect this by getting an ionized calcium after a regular calcium and then giving calcium. And for whatever reason, if you wanted to assess the prognosis of the patient in front of you, and you can only choose one lab test, and this is a great pimp question, you use the BUN. Why that is, I don't know, but the BUN is the most sensitive for prognosis. In reality, what you're going to do is plug in the Apache 2 score, use the Ransons criteria to determine their prognosis. But it turns out that your clinical acumen is almost just as good. The person who's hypotensive needs to be intubated is probably not going to do very well. The person who has no pain on day two and starts eating is going to do well. So clinical acumen is just as good as these scoring systems, but know that the scoring systems exist and that if you have to pick one test, it's the BUN. And very much in the same way of ARDS, in the setting of acute pancreatitis as an early complication, you might just get fluid shifts. And that can lead to ascites or pleural effusions. Pleural effusions are usually diagnosed on chest x-ray, and ascites can be diagnosed with an ultrasound. The most important thing is that you do not tap these. You do not put in a chest tube. You don't drain fluid in the setting of pancreatitis unless you think it is infected. If the person comes in with pancreatitis and you think it's just a regular pancreatitis, but they're not getting better, or after a couple of days, they then become septic. They develop a fever and leukocytosis. Their blood pressure starts going down. That's the time that you should think of an infection. In an infected pancreas, you should look for necrosis on the CT. But you're going to have to get a biopsy. And this represents a major change in the management of pancreatitis. It used to be if you saw a certain percentage of necrosis, you just give them antibiotics. Turns out that didn't work. You have to have a piece of tissue that says this tissue is infected for it to make a difference. You start with meropenem and then change to whatever the cultures and sensitivities show. But then much later, this is the person who had pancreatitis, left the hospital, and then comes back to clinic complaining of something new. There are two things that could happen. That is an abscess or a pseudocyst. Now an abscess is going to present very much like other abscesses. They're going to be fever, SIRS. You may not even think it has anything to do with the pancreatitis, but if they just recently had pancreatitis and are newly infected looking ill, consider getting a CT scan. And if they have an abscess, you drain it and do antibiotics. The pseudocyst is also diagnosed with a CT scan. But a pseudocyst is a pseudocyst. It's not epithelial lined, but it's this big pocket of fluid and it can get, they can get quite large and they can push on things. So you might get small bowel obstructions, you might get early satiety or just abdominal fullness. If that happens, it's likely to be a pseudocyst, and the right answer then is due to CT scan. And based on the CT findings, you're going to determine what to do. It follows the six and six rule. If it is less than six centimeters and less than six weeks old, you watch and wait. If it is greater than six centimeters or it's been around longer than six weeks, then you have to drain it and get a biopsy. And how you drain doesn't matter. Essentially, all the time, if you have to do anything to the pancreas, don't open the belly. If you can do it with, through an EGD, that is connect the cyst to the gut, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, whatever, or if you can do it percutaneously and drain it to the outside, that's preferred. Try not to open the abdomen in the setting of pancreatitis or its complications and you have to biopsy it to make sure that it's not a malignancy because malignancy can present with acute pancreatitis and a pseudocyst. Okay, so we talked about complications, recognize their presentation and how to manage them, but then really pay close attention to the classic presentation of pancreatitis. The usual pancreatitis is epigastric pain radiating into the back, lipase is elevated, NPO, IV, pain medications, and time. Taking note of when to do these tests and which of the things we've learned empirically 
don't help. That's pancreatitis.